Hello, Next Level listeners. My name is Brian Lemmer, and I'm bringing to you our fifth episode of the Next Level podcast. Today is a segment of The Main Thing, where we explore a few of the the main things or the main themes from our most recent interview. Our last interview is up and available on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. We are currently waiting to be verified on Stitcher and Pandora, so you can listen to us however you please. If you are watching on YouTube, You can already see that we are not producing this in the same location as each other due to the COVID-19 outbreak. We are in our homes and using Google Hangouts to record this session. And that means you finally get to see what we look like. So I'm Brian. You guys can give a wave and introduce yourselves. Go ahead, Olden. (laughs) And I'm Joe. Awesome. So in our last episode, we talked with John Schuster. He's a 2018 Olympic gold medalist. And how he combined, we talked about how he combined his love for competition and his enjoyment of curling and took it to the next level. So let's let's dive in right away. And, and Joe, I want to start with a, a brief or, or not so brief maybe discussion about passion because I don't think we really talked about it enough, especially considering passion might be the underlying core of everybody we interview. So if you Google, and I have it pulled up right now, Google passion and you get the little Oxford Dictionary definition, comes up as a strong and barely controllable emotion, which I think is pretty vague. So did some did some homework, did some thinking about what passion is to me and pretty similar. Obviously, we just interviewed John, so it's pretty similar to what he said. But for me, passion is something that I enjoy. I need to be I need to want to be involved with it. And I also want to learn when I'm doing it. I don't just want to go through the motions. It's something that I need to, to grow under. And then as I grow and I develop my level of mastery, it still needs to challenge me. So if I can do something once and I've mastered it. I, I typically don't have a lot of passion there. Um, but if I do something many times, there's a lot of room to grow and it's something that I enjoy and I can also be social with it, that for me is, is how, how I drive my passion. So I don't know if you guys want to talk about your definitions or you want to pick my definition apart and then change it. But I think we should really set some boundaries of what is passion or maybe not boundaries, but some guidelines to what is passion when we talk about passion. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Brian, like I've, I don't think I've ever Googled the definition or, or looked up the definition of passion, but it's a word that we all use a lot. I think, mm-hmm. you know, in the sports industry or, uh, you know, even just in the any, anything high performance, we use that word a lot. You know, I, I liked in the in the definition you brought up just the the word uncontrollable, right? And I think that's mm-hmm. a big component of it that it just it's not something that you can necessarily uh I don't know if you can, if you can really cultivate it. I don't know if you can control it. I don't, I don't know if you can, you know, say, you know, I, I want more passion. So I'm going to instill that in myself. It's, you have to kind of just feel it and let it almost sort of just grow within you. Um, yeah, I don't think I, yeah, go ahead. It it is. It, it, for me, like when I think about passion, it's less of how can I explain it? And it's more of when I'm doing something, I feel it or I don't. And that it's, it's mm-hmm. almost like, it's not necessarily a binary switch of how I feel it, but there is a level of, I'm either passionate about something and I can feel it or I'm passionate about something and I can't feel it. It's not something I can talk myself into. Yeah. I think, you know, the way I would define it is uh, like, I don't have a crisp de- definition of it, but mm-hmm. you know, I guess it, just by a, a scenario, maybe it is a, is a better way that I would find it to find it would be. If, you know, if you're a soccer player and you go and you play a 90 minute game and you get home and the first thing you want to do when you get home is, you know, put your studs back on and go out and kick a ball around, take more shots or, you know, uh, juggle the ball or, or get a drill in or whatever it might be. If you got 90 minutes of it and you just still didn't get your fix, you still didn't get enough of it. Mm-hmm. That to me would define passion. And that could be any sport or again, any industry. If you, you know, if you were in a piano recital and you you did it, you played it and and everything went well, but you got home and you just couldn't wait to get over to the keyboard again or get over to the, the piano again and just try something different and, you know, just feel the, you know, the keys on your fingers or whatever it might be like that to me is how I would define passion. You just, you know, again, it's that uncontrollable urge that you just can't get enough of it. Yeah. Holden, any thoughts? Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting. Like we didn't really talk to um, Schuster about it, but like losing passion, you know, like, you know, they talk about having it, Mm -hmm. but how about when you lose it? 
Like, yeah, absolutely. That's a big thing. Cause there's a lot of things where, you know, you can be good with it for a long time. And like Joe was saying, like you want to get home, you just want to do it. But how about when you get home and you don't want to do it? You know, and he mm-hmm. kind of talked about like the summer, you know, that one summer where he had to you mm-hmm. know, go and practice down in, I think green Bay. Yeah. Um, and how it was tough getting back in the season. Cause that was kind of his break. So it was kind of like he wanted to rebuild that passion and really, you know, like right now, like I'm really missing soccer. Like I really want to shoot soccer. Like Mm -hmm. I'm excited for it. So my passion to go shoot and take photos of soccer is it's really high right now. But, you know, right at the end of fall, it was probably dwindling a little bit. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that'd be an interesting thing to talk about is how, you know, you have to take time to reflect and then, you know, get that passion back up because you can't be passionate about everything. Yeah. hundred percent of the time. You'll never make it. I think it'd be interesting to kind of see the correlation between passion and results then too. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so as it becomes more result driven and you're in your training for whatever your specific discipline might be, and you get so worked up about the result and you get so rigid with, you know, with your training and it almost becomes work. Yeah. Is that, is that where maybe you start to lose that passion? And, you know, I've talked to a couple of players, you know, just through, through coaching who have talked about just missing the sport, you know, an injury comes up mm-hmm. or, you know, like you're talking about Holden where you're just, you're in the off season and, and you don't have that chance to necessarily be a part of it every day. And that's where you really start to, you know, that you feel that passion grow and you feel yeah. that just that sense of, of, uh, wanting something, um, grow again is, is that because you're not really driven for the result then? And you're just, it's just kind of love of, of that particular discipline or that particular activity. I don't know. Maybe there's a correlation there that we could try to pinpoint through some of our, our further conversations. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's just interesting. Like for me, like I don't like watching soccer on the TV. I hate it. I will not do it. But right now, like for the past month, I love it. <laughs> so is it, yeah. So it's a, big change i mean and for the next few months i'm sure i'm gonna love it even though it's gonna be old stuff but yeah it, it'll be interesting to see or like to hear what schuster you know like when he got caught and all that stuff like did his passion drop or was it yeah i hate this um he's more passionate now and he kind of made it sound like he became more passionate like you said like you know did it make you think like maybe this isn't for me and he was like no like this was this is what I need to do. And he said, like, you know, he had a choice. It was not just him anymore. It was his family. And then I think he had one kid and then he had a kid on the way or I don't know what mm-hmm. it was. But yeah, I mean. You'll have to go listen to, to find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quick plug there from Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that we, we it, it sounds like all of us agree on is passion is pretty dynamic and maybe not on a day-to-day level. But if you think about for instance, at the start of a season to the end of the season, your excitement to get up in the morning and go grind out a practice session is is a little different. But one thing we should talk about too is I don't believe necessarily that passion is innate. I wasn't born and was soccer, 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 running, running, Mm -hmm. running. I I don't think I really was passionate about running until probably my senior year of cross country. Even track was just something to do between soccer seasons. And then all of a sudden I realized like, oh, Maybe I do enjoy this a lot more than I thought I did. And it, it almost, I don't think passion is learned, but I think there is a level of, you have to have some level of mastery and skill in what you're passionate about. Otherwise it literally is just a grind over and over and you just beat yourself up. I don't know if you guys can attest to that at all. Say that again. Like So to me, to, to sum it up, passion, like it's not necessarily you learn your passion, but you're not innately passionate about things. You have to have a level of exposure and a level of mastery with something in order to be truly passionate about it. So what I'm thinking of is like, Holden, two years ago, I I would doubt you, I doubt you would claim that photography is a huge passion. Whereas I think today, if somebody asked you like how passionate are you about photography, you might claim it, it might be your number one or t- like a top three passion. And I don't know if there was a, switch where one day you were like yes photography i'm super passionate about it and it correlated with your learning process or mm-hmm. if you've just been exposed to it like i don't know if you can go into that at all yeah i think actually it was probably the opposite way like there's things i was passionate about mm-hmm. but i wasn't doing anymore like i was done with soccer you know i was kind of like out of the sports scene but i realized that like photography and videography would get me back into there 
Mm-hmm. So it was more of like, get me back to my passion. And then now I don't even think I'm passionate about photography. It's more about being better. Mm. Like, I don't really care about, you know, going and taking photos. I just want to go and take photos and make sure that they're better than the last time. Okay. So like, that's my goal. It's not to be, not just go do it. It's like, make sure that every time I do it, I'm learning one more thing. I'm doing one more thing better. When mm-hmm. I edit, it's one more thing that's, I learn one more thing. I think I'm more passionate about that than actually taking photos or photography or any of that. Yeah. So and what that, you're saying is, sorry to cut you off, Brian. No, go for it. I think what it. I'm hearing from Holden is like proficiency in that discipline isn't necessarily tied into the passion. And, and I think mm-hmm. about just, you know, for anybody who's a sports fan. And so, I mean, for me, like I'm a big Liverpool fan. And it's never been my goal to be the biggest Liverpool fan or to Mm -hmm. be the best fan or to be a better fan than anybody else. It's just I have a love for that team and that club and and the tradition and history there. And but it it really has nothing to do with my own proficiency in that. Now, I think Mm -hmm. that you could turn around then, Brian, and say that proficiency can help that passion grow. Uh, And I think the two are linked quite a bit because I think having that passion also gives you the grit to to kind of grind through uh you know the adversity that might come along with with the lack of proficiency um you know kind of on your journey to get better and better at anything um i think that that's where that that passion really comes into play um so i I think it can it can definitely help but i don't think it's a necessity either yeah and i think so for instance i use the word mastery and a lot of people when they hear mastery think top level but when you when you talk about soccer skills just being able to touch the ball a foot forward in the direction you intend to it that's a level of mastery that if you go look Mm -hmm. at a top level player like ronaldo they don't even think about it but if you look at like if i tried to teach my dad soccer the first thing we would look at for mastery is can you accurately pass a ball five feet or dribble in a straight line and and there is a level of you need to know the fundamentals sound like bo ryan all of a sudden um and i think proficiency for instance it's not necessarily backwards compatible just because you're really good at something doesn't mean you're super passionate about it but typically Mm -hmm. the things you're passionate about you don't become good relative to everybody but you grow and you become good at compared to where you started at i don't know if that lines up with what you guys have in mind i think it lines up with what you guys are saying but yeah i can get on board with that Mm -hmm. yeah i agree i agree i think if you're passionate about something you're probably going to be successful you know it's, it's hard to be passionate about something that you can't be successful in if that makes sense yeah, it's and hard, and it's I think it, really lo- yeah, it's hard to really it, love something if you can't be good at it or you mm-hmm. can't do good. I mean, I think that's what you're kind of getting at. I think it also goes to if you're passionate about something, like Joe said, you want to spend the time at it, and it's really hard to do something hour on hour on hour and mm-hmm. not develop some level of oh, maybe I should do this instead. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you you're guided in in your learning process, you get better quicker and more efficiently, but if you just, for instance, I'm starting to get into rock climbing a lot more than I used to. And it's really hard to not just get stronger and be able to make certain moves and have control over my body that I what like I can do things that I couldn't do a week ago just because I do it. And I'm not, nobody's telling me, hey, try to hold this way or try to reach this way. It's just like, oh, my body's better if I do this. And I think there is a level of if you just do something, you get better eventually. And if you're passionate about it, you'll want to do it. And it, it's a mm-hmm. it's a huge underlying. It's 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 very important to be passionate about what you're doing. Otherwise, you burn out on it, or you just don't spend the time to do it. So here's here's the question that I would ask then: Is the passion? So take rock climbing for you for as an example. Is the passion for rock climbing then, or is the passion for learning the new skill? Because what you're talking about is when you know you learn that that yeah. new skill, it, it you get excited about it. So you know. Is, is rock climbing the thing or is it just an athletic endeavor that really is the thing? And it could really, it could be rock climbing or it could be kayaking or it could be, you know, a number of different outdoor, you know, type sports. Um, that would be my question is, is really, is it, is it you, is, is your passion for the sport itself or is it for just learning something new? Yeah, to go a little little bit into, I guess, my personal life, but growing up, I, I spent a lot of time outside. We, I, 
for we moved I, my family moved around a lot growing up but we had a, a moment where we lived on a, a farm it was a hobby farm we didn't have any animals we we raised boats because we rented out our farm or we rented out our barn space people could store their boats <laughs> and rvs and whatnot um but i would spend a lot of time climbing trees running through the fields like just playing soccer in the yard by myself and for me it's it's almost like a way to ground myself in who i used to be in a sense like i don't know not to get too mystic with it but it's something I used to enjoy that I haven't done in a very long time. And in that, in that sense, it, it brings back childish enjoyment. And then, like you said, there is a level of, I'm so early on the learning curve that it's just super fun to go learn and be better. And like what Holden said about photography, I think it's a human, maybe I'm going to claim too much here, but I think it's a human desire to learn and just improve at something. It's why you'll see people get invested in a TV show, not necessarily because they love what the TV show is talking about, but they love developing the relationship with who's on screen. And in a way, that's that's a way to learn about somebody. And I think, I think passion is, there is a huge passion in learning, but I think you're also able to be passionate about doing a very specific type of learning. So talking, like me with rock climbing, I would, I would agree with you that there's probably a lot more passion in the learning the process. When when John talked about, I'm going to drop the quote, when he talked about loving the process of winning more than actually winning. Um, I, I think that there is a huge element of, I love the process of learning more than actually having learned something. I, I don't find it super impressive to say, hey, look at, I can run this far at this pace, but I love grinding out the workouts and, and running with people and, and getting better as a runner, if that makes sense. So, so I think there is a level of the passion is largely rooted in how much of the process do you love, not how much of the outcome do you love? Well, I think if you think about the outcome piece of it, if you're, if you're truly just passionate about the outcome, I, I don't know that that, I don't know that that can exist because with the outcome comes a finality to it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's going to end. And yeah. when I think about something, again, to get back to the example before, if you're truly passionate about something, I feel like you almost don't want it to end. Mm -hmm. So that's where the process comes into play of being passionate about the process because that process can be ongoing where if I'm just, you know, if I'm going to say that I'm, I'm passionate about winning or I'm passionate about trying to achieve a, a championship, well, I would say that that's not true passion. Like that's a want and a desire yeah. and that's, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in terms of the passion, the passion is more for the process behind the scenes that, you know, you might win that championship, but tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're still going to get back to work because you just, you love that activity so much. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I think we could talk about passion forever, <laughs> um, but I think this is a good opportunity to segment into how important is winning and losing um, and how, how long should you bask or mourn in your wins and losses? Schuster, in my mind, it really stuck out when he talked about he always cries during the medal ceremony when he hears, I imagine, I can't remember the exact wording, but I imagine it's when he hears the U.S. anthem. He doesn't hear the Korean anthem and start bawling. Um, right. <laughs> but he didn't cry when he won because he was so dialed in. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm sure he he looks at the medal and he got back home after and he he thought like, wow, I just I just won. Um, how long do you how long do you let your wins take effect? And how how much how much does winning really affect you versus what you just talked about? How much is it cool? I won, but I it's more important to keep playing or keep doing. Yeah, I think there's a couple different routes we can go with this, Brian. I mean, you know one of the questions that we've been kind of asking behind the scenes after we interview folks has been, you know, do you enjoy winning more uh, than you hate losing or is it the other way around? And I think we could take, you know, this conversation that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think specific to just the winning piece of it, how long does that last? I think that's going to differ for everybody. I think it's going to differ on, you know, is it, did you just win the first game of the season or did you win the championship game? Um, it might differ on, you know, the opponent a little bit. Um, it might differ on, I mean, it might be different. Just what did you go through that week? I mean, if you hit some adversity in training and you had, you know, two injuries that popped up that you weren't you know, accounting for and, and you pulled off a win that maybe you look like it was a little bit more or looked at it like it was a little bit more impossible at the beginning of the week and you were able to pull it off. Do you revel in that win a little bit more? I think it's going to vary, you know, just from, from victory to victory. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but I do think it's important that you you do enjoy the result a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I think it's, you know, we've talked a lot about already just in a few episodes, not really getting so caught up in the result. Um, but I think being competitive, you are, the the results do matter to an extent. Right. And so I think when you lose, it's okay for that to sting a little bit. Um, and, and when you win, you should embrace that. You should feel that, you know, that joy of you accomplish that result that you're after. Um, I mean, does that kind of get to your question? Yeah, I, I guess I'm thinking about who's listening and what they what they might be thinking about. So we had, and growing up, we had ter- like playing soccer, we had a bunch of tournaments and you'd play multiple games a day. But we had this season, we had a doubleheader on a weekend where we played a game on Saturday and then we played a game on Sunday. Let's just say hypothetically, you win Saturday. These games are, let's say, they're of equal importance. It doesn't really matter. But you win Saturday and you now have, 24 hours or maybe even less than to turn around and you got to play another game. How important or unimportant is that victory in terms of now you got to prepare for the next game? Do you lump those two games together and you win the first, you win the second great, awesome weekend, or do you win the first, lose the second? And now your weekend's ruined because you're thinking more of the second game than the first game. I mean, when you have quick turnover, because I think most athletes, especially the younger you are, it's, it's, you have so many games thrown at you. Is it important to really feel those victories out or is winning and losing not really that important until you're at a high enough level to where you're, you're being essentially you're being watched with money. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Like how important is winning and losing at different levels? I think whenever the result comes into play, it's, it is important to embrace the victory and, and, you know, kind of lament the loss a little bit. You know, one of the things, uh, just taking back to our own season here, when we lost in the in the NCAA tournament, one of the questions that I was asked after the fact was, you know, it basically got to the the point of, you're, are you already thinking about next season? Are you already preparing for next season? And this is, I mean, literally minutes after we had lost yeah. in, in a penalty shootout in the national tournament. And to be honest, like I was, I was pretty frustrated with the question. And mm-hmm. Because to me, no, we weren't thinking about next season and and how, I mean, I looked at our seniors and thought, like, what a big slap in the face to them, Mm -hmm. right? That we've just done away with their entire season and the minute the game is over, we're already thinking about next season. Like, no, let's take some time and really cherish everything we've done this Mm -hmm. season. And so it wasn't even just the result of that day. and, And yeah, we lost, but the overall season was a victory in in my mind. And I think a, a lot of guys in the team, it was a victory um, even though the, you know, the final game was a loss. And so I think we really, I think to answer your question, Brian, it all gets back to just being present in the moment. Right. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I don't know if there's a magic formula for, and I've heard, you know, coaches talk about, you know, a 15 minute rule or a 45 minute rule or a, a next day rule or whatever it might be where it's, Okay, put that result behind you. Now we're going to get to work on the next one. And I think that's all fine and good. I don't know that there's a magical formula for when you really need to get over the previous result and start to gear up for the next, you know, not even result, but just the next challenge. Mm -hmm. I think it's, again, it's going to differ based on the challenge you just overcame, right? So, you know, that, that game might, it might take an hour to get over a loss or it might take 30 minutes of just feeling really good about that win. And I think, you know, most athletes, most coaches, they'll kind of know um, when it's time to get ready for the next challenge. But I do think it is important to, to stay present for a time after each contest to reflect and, you know, to embrace the good in it and, you know, to, to maybe challenge yourself to, to get over the bat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I have a cool point to that or not cool, but good. Um, So in wrestling, my senior year, our section, our section, it's a format layout. And in the semifinals, number two and number three, which was me and another guy, we were wrestling on this mat and number one and number five were wrestling on the mat next to us. I beat the number three seed and I stood up and I look over and the number five seed is putting in the number one seed, which was in my mind, I'm like, great. I'm going to wrestle mm-hmm. the five seed. I ended up wrestling him, but I got off the mat and I was hyped that I won. And my dad looked at me and he was completely serious. When I got up in the stands, he's like, you can't lose. 
He's like, you literally cannot lose because if you lose, you're wrestling the number one seed. And the number one seed was super good. And it slapped me in the face. I was like, shoot. Like, that was not my thought process. I was like, I just want him in the finals. And he's like, no, you can't lose. Like, if you lose, I mean, number one seed's going to win against the number three seed. And yeah, but it's one of those things where, like, I was happy for, like, five minutes. And I was like, oh, shoot. Like, I got to focus on the next one. And, you know, it was just the next day. But still, I was like, that win was great. But I got to move on. Which in, like, a regular season match, you know, I would have been like, okay, good. We won. You know, you wrestle one match a day. But when you get to those big tournaments, it's, you know, three, four a day. So Yeah. I, I think that's a great example to, one, reiterate what Joe said, that mm-hmm. some games matter more than others. And just innately, like, you were wrestling in, you yeah. said, the state championship. So that's obviously more uh, section. 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 Yeah, so yeah. that game just innately is more important than, mm-hmm. or that match, I don't know what they're called in wrestling, is more match. important than a random match here and there in the season mm-hmm. against who knows what school. And in that sense, those wins and losses mean a lot more. But then there's also the, the turnover that I mentioned that sometimes you, you have a, you have a great victory and then you have 20 minutes where it's like, shoot, we need to get in the, in the game mode again. And mm-hmm. and I heard a lot from Schuster. It sounds like he went through the trials and tribulations of just taking L's that he shouldn't have been taking. And all of a sudden, like he mentioned, you had to win, you had to win the next game, next three or four games, even to just survive. And there was a level of, it sounded to me when he talked about how he was so in the mode, in the, yeah, in the flow after that win. It wasn't like he was just in the flow for that last finals game. It sounded like he checked in after, I can't remember, he said he was two and four or four and two, whatever it was. He checked in after that loss and just decided, I'm in the game mode for the next couple of days. Mm-hmm. And it, you can't just check out when you're dialed in. And there is a level of, do can you celebrate when you're dialed in? Or when you're dialed in, are you just playing the game? Yeah, I think you can celebrate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, so with with any sport that operates in the in the realm of a season, um, you know, you can look at it as each game, there's a there's an opportunity for victory and loss, but then throughout the season as well, you're looking at it as a as sort of a whole, right? And so I guess the example that I would bring up is for me, I I love going to work the next day after a win <laughs> right i mean i just yeah. i love mm-hmm. you know checking in with all the other coaches hey congrats on the win you just feel a little bit of a boost you see the the boys in the hall and and you you know you're giving them high fives and just i mean there, there's just there's an energy about the day after a win you know and i i guess like reflecting back on it so do you hate going to work the day after a loss and i think when i first started my career i used to to hate that day because I just, I wanted to go just hole up in my office and not talk to anybody. I didn't want to talk about the previous game. Mm -hmm. And I think where I've got to not wanting to talk to anybody. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Taking a cheap shot there. So I appreciate that. (laughs) But no, I mean, but, but in all seriousness, like I, I did, I, I I didn't want to be there, but I think more so now I've gotten to the point where I kind of, and maybe my my wife would disagree with me because she's the, always the one that sees me after a loss, you <laughs> yeah. know. And, and yeah. she probably would say that I'm not the most peachy person to be around, you know. After, the, <laughs> but mm-hmm. I think I've gotten over it quicker now, it, mm-hmm. where it's I actually get excited by the next morning to get back to work because literally, it's it's a challenge, and and I'm getting back to work. I, I'm going to enter the office the next day thinking about, okay, we're not good enough right now. I need to recruit harder. Like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be re-energized in my recruiting with our current team. We're, we didn't perform well enough. What things do we need to fix? And, you know, so I get back to the office more to like kind of recharge and, and just kind of feel this sense of urgency and, and fun. And, you know, how can we, it gives me as a coach sort of a job to do. Right. When, Mm -hmm. when you're Mm -hmm. winning and and things are going well, it's almost like, I don't want to screw this up. I'm going to kind of, you know, not try to experiment too much and not try to change too much because we're on a winning streak. So I want to, I don't want to be the guy that screws that up. Right. Yeah. Versus when, when it's the day after a loss, it's kind of like you have this free reign to just basically, you could throw out literally everything and say, things are not working. We're changing everything about our system, our philosophy, our style, all that. Right. 
you have the freedom to do that more, um, I guess, the day after a loss. So to kind of bring this chunk of the conversation with the last chunk of the conversation, you have a passion for a sport or a thing, whatever it is. And then you also have the results that you, you typically celebrate good results, whether that's scoring a certain amount of points, whether that's a win or a loss or achieving a certain national rank or championship. Do those two things, results and passion, do they drive each other? Do they go kind of hand in hand? Do they inversely affect each other? If you're putting your focus on the results, does it get in the way of being passionate about the sport? Or if you're really passionate about the sport, does it naturally drive good results and you can celebrate those more because you're achieving them more? How did how does your passion and your results, how do those relate together? Especially, I think, from a coaching standpoint, you'll have the, the not just for you specifically, but you've been a part of very successful teams and you've also had certain teams that underachieve, so to speak. And you've been a part of teams that maybe have maybe been better or worse than what they could have been. Like, how did the, the passion and how do the results, how do they drive together? Well, I would maybe revert back to the conversation we have with John. You know, he talked about how the care of the result really got in the way of performing. And he was talking about how when they were two and four, he had the, you know, the, the walk with his wife where he was saying just, you know, I, I was playing the, the best I've, I've ever played leading up to this. But every time I get in the Olympics, I just am not performing to the, to the level I want to. And I think he had that, that moment of like kind of self actualization or just the realization that, he was caring too much about the product and about the result. And it was putting some undue pressure on him of really just trying to achieve the result versus just trying to play his best and be his best. Right. And sort of getting back to what we talked about earlier, Brian, of just the, uh, the process and the passion and, and how those two things are interlinked. And I think when, what he was saying was that when he got back to just, enjoying and just trying to you know have three more games for his kids and you know be there for his teammates and just really kind of soaking up the olympic uh kind of moments and and uh atmosphere and, and just the scene there when he got back to just enjoying that and really just trying to play his best it wasn't about can i get the result or not it was just can i leave it all out there and and really take advantage of this opportunity that that we've created for ourselves Mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean i think i don't know that there's a a formula that you know uh passion results can't be linked Mm -hmm. but i would say that they they certainly don't have to be linked yeah i like that um one thing i noticed too kind of segueing out of this but one thing i noticed is how compassionate john was for the sport as a whole as talking about how much he enjoyed practice how much he enjoyed other people on his team, how compassionate he was for his competitors. Some of them he knew because they were other USA members. And then the way he talked about, he had so much respect for, when he talked about how the European teams traveled and they could just get up and go right away. There was such a level in my mind of respect in that statement. It wasn't like, oh, they just magically get away with it. It was like, they know what they're doing. At, at some level, does your passion for your sport have to trickle into passion for your teammates and your competitors? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I guess I, I wouldn't pretend to have an answer to that, yeah. that question, but I, I do think that some correlations that I would see are, I think that you can learn from your competitors and your teammates. And, and again, that might get back to your own passion of, you know, just trying to, to get better. And, and you might see a, a skill that a competitor do, has, you know, a, an opponent has a, you know, pick a sport, just they can do mm-hmm. something you can't do. And that drives you to say, man, I, I think I could do that if I worked on it. Like it can <sighs> kind of reignite some passion that way. Um, but I do think there's a danger at times where we can get too caught up into what our competition is doing. And Mm -hmm. we, we start to gain more sight of like, what is our opponent doing and how do we beat them versus just looking inward and saying, 
how can I be at my best? And so I, I do think there's a danger if that balance gets out of whack a little bit. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. it does. And oh, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Well, Lemmer, you're talking about like compassion and everything, but I think mm-hmm. like what we're what we're doing right here is a good example. Like we're all passionate about multiple different things. Mm-hmm. And you know, Mooney, you kind of brought us all together and did this because you kind of want to grow your side of professionalism stuff. And we all had, you know, our side and all kind of combined. But, you know, I don't think if Mooney, if you weren't compassionate about, you know, helping the people around you and your teammates and, you know, the people on your team and around your team, I don't think your team would be as good as it is. You know what I mean? I don't think you can be good without the people around you also being passionate. Because, you know, you you can see when there's a weak link and it's usually because they're not passionate. You know, Mm -hmm. they as much as everyone else so then it becomes very apparent and it becomes easy to see that you know there where that's where stuff is going wrong is where the passion isn't there so i I really that's i want to pull on that thread a little bit yeah Yeah. go for it Um, go for it i think that there are ways to create an environment Mm -hmm. that breeds more passion so again i don't know that you can necessarily like instill that passion within Mm -hmm. yourself and i've talked about at times where I, I do think it's hard to coach passion into somebody. Yeah. You know, you can't just take an individual and say, be more passionate, right? Like yeah. that's just not going to work. And and I've talked about, there've been players in the team. And I think we talked about this a little bit, even with, with Sean Morgan, you know, uh, mm-hmm. going back a couple of episodes where there were times where he, you know, maybe that passion almost went a little bit too far and, and it, it gave him mm-hmm. almost a little bit too much edge or, you know, where he got in trouble. You talked about, you know, Dave Robinson not talking to him yeah. after he got a red card because he was yeah. so into the game, right? And he and he went overboard. Mm-hmm. And so I guess getting back to it, what I'm saying is that I think that there are times where I've, I've looked at players and said, you know, your passion, you almost have too much or you don't know how to channel it properly. Mm-hmm. I would rather work with somebody like that because we can channel it and it's yep. easier to, to dial it back and, and come up with strategies for how to, to, you know, control it. And, and again, I guess this gets back to your definition, Brian, of whether or not you can actually control it, but mm-hmm. ways to channel it better versus, you know, working with a guy that doesn't have passion and trying to instill mm-hmm. that into him individually. I think that's very difficult, but can you create an environment that breeds more passion? Mm-hmm. That that to me, I think there's there's definitely strategies and ways to to breed passion within an environment. Um, if you're surrounded by 25 other guys who are passionate about something, chances are you're probably going to start to share in that passion, right? Yeah, yeah. and I think and if not, thing. you definitely decide like this isn't for me, and you're probably getting out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I think like well, right now like UWS, they're like we've talked about culture a lot, and you know that's kind of like the big you know, the buzzword about UWS, Mm -hmm. it's all culture. I think there's 400 people, you know, part of the athletic department and the athletes and everything are 400 plus. There is a lot of culture of passion, you know, and everyone's really close and it breeds good teams because everyone is passionate and they fit together. Like I, even in high school, like there were, the teams wouldn't talk to each other, you know, like some of the players on, you know, a basketball team wouldn't talk to the hockey guys, you know, a lot would, but some wouldn't here. It's not like that. It's like everyone is close. Everyone's close knit. And it's cool to see. And I think that is because of the culture of passion and the, you know, you know, an area that passion can be, it, people are allowed to be passionate without being judged. I think that's a big, big thing. Yeah. And I think there is a level of, I'm just going to tell a quick story about my senior year cross country where, so for my team, for instance, my cross country team at the end of the season comes down to, I can't remember if it was sectionals or regionals, but let's just say it was sectionals. You as a team in order to qualify for state, everybody scores a point based on their position and the two teams with the lowest amount of points go to state and you measure your top five runners, I think. And then you have two alternate runners in case somebody drops out. We, Wasa East were, I think five points, maybe three points short of DC Everest going to state as a team. And there were guys on my team that like, during the season, didn't have time for their co- competitors. They didn't want to talk to people from the other team. They didn't want to mm-hmm. like look like when it w- it was. Here's our team. We go out. We we do our thing. We run. But me, the whole season, it was like I wanted to get to know these guys. I was finishing next to. I wanted to talk to them. When we go up, luckily I was I was skilled enough as a runner to medal every once in a while at meets, and I would talk to the people when they call our names while we were waiting. And when we got to that meet, even though I was devastated that we, my team didn't make it to state. I was also super excited that 
my friends and another team were going to go get to experience the state experience. It was, it was really, it was really weird for me in the moment. And also looking back that for me, it was bigger than just me, myself. It was bigger than me, my team. There was a level of like the whole sport, the, yeah. like the passion for me ran deeper than just, this is where I'm at in the game. This is, this is what my click is. It was like the whole sport has this, this wonderful opportunity where we get to, we get to, go run against the best of the best and whatnot. And it sucked. It still does that we were single digit amount of points different. It's like somebody, somebody has a three second PR in the middle of the pack and they're passing four or five guys. And that's the difference. But on another level, it was like, who knows, maybe the other team, some kid did that. And that's why they went through. Like, it, it was just a really weird mindset for me. And I was looking back and it was like, for me as a runner, it was more about running as a sport than it was about me as a runner. And I think that spoke to me as like, holy crap, I need to run way more than I do. I think, I think John touched on that because he was, he really wanted to grow the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, he talked about himself being good and doing well, but he said that he really wanted to grow the sport. He wanted to make it here in the U S and he said that he thinks that it's happening. So, cause he, you know, he was talking about how people would, well, it happened to us. You know, a kid came up and asked for an autograph. Yeah, like, yeah. He said he loves that stuff because he knows mm -hmm. that it's growing the sport, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, right. And I loved, hold, I loved how he talked about. He didn't feel a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He felt more a sense of opportunity, and he just yeah. really enjoyed. That. Like I loved that part of the conversation. Yeah, that too. It was just, it was a sense of joy. It was never uh -huh. a, a burden to him to mm -hmm. help grow the sport. You know, you guys know that I'm I'm big into Michael Gervais, sports psychologist. He's got a podcast, yep. Finding Mastery. And for anybody that listens to that podcast, you'll see some similarities in this one. And, and it's definitely an influence on what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, he talks about, Gervais talks about how he doesn't feel like true mastery can be accomplished until you start to share with others, until you get to that moment mm -hmm. where you start to teach. It's not just about mm -hmm. growing this proficiency within yourself true mastery comes when you can actually share that with others. And I think it, it can be in, in moments of teaching. It can be in moments of inspiration. It can be in moments of just sharing that passion. And I think when we look back to, to John, to, to Schuster's, uh, sorry, when we look back to, to Schuster's interview, that moment in the locker room. So when they were two and four and he had had his walk with his wife and kind of come to that realization that he was just going to really kind of enjoy this and, and just try to be his best. He talked about being in the locker room, talking to his guys and saying, I am going to be the best skip, the best captain, the best teammate that I can be for you guys. And I would challenge you guys to do the same. And that to me, that that's a side I, you know, I've got to know John a, a little bit here or quite a bit over the last couple of years. Um, but that's a side of him that I haven't seen, you know, that I yeah. didn't know mm -hmm. about just how truly he, he cares about his teammates and, and mm -hmm. really encouraging them to be the best versions of themselves. That was a really cool moment. I thought. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's build in a little bit of, so one thing I, I was realizing when I was talking about running is as much as I was compassionate for the sport, I needed to do well for myself. Like I, I was too competitive with, others and myself, but I also wanted them to do well as, one as, as much as I wanted to do well. And I got from John, like, yeah, he wants to, to bring the sport up. And, and like you said, he has that opportunity, but I also got from him that he needs to win. Like he needed to, he talked about how he needed to go win the Olympic gold medal, winning USA or winning national champions, winning the collegiate world championship, like cool, but he needed to win the gold medal. How, kind of going back to balancing results and passion, how does the competitive attitude fit into being passionate about something? See, I, I took something different away from that, that part of the conversation, mm -hmm. Brian. Like, yeah. Well, what would you think that? Away? Well, I think he, what he was saying was that the, the need to win at times probably drove him to, to train harder, to train more, to be mm -hmm. more focused and dedicated throughout but I also think what he pointed out was that need to win was negatively impacting his ability to perform in those big mm -hmm. moments. And when he let go of that need to win, that's when he was performing at his best. Yeah. So I think separating the results 
from the idea of performing your best and being a competitor. Because for me, like I know when I'm going into a situation, like as a runner, I know right now I'm not capable of going and running like a 410 mile. But going out and having a good race for me and being an, a, an able competitor is important, even if the result isn't there. And for me, that's driven from my passion. But I, I would guess that for others, it, it's might not be connected that they need to compete because they need to win or they need to compete because that's just their nature is they're super competitive. Like what I'm trying to get at is like, how competitive can you get before it gets in the way of your passion? And is that kind of what you're saying? It sounds like is, is if your comp, comp if your competitive nature is results driven, it will get in the way of your passion. But if you just want to be your best and you need to compete to do that, it supplements your passion. I think it all comes down to the way you define competition competitiveness and just competing and you can define that as trying to beat your opponent you can define it as trying to be the best or you can define it as trying to perform at your highest ability reaching your ceiling whatever that might be and trying to maximize your own potential and i think that it really comes down to which avenue you you choose to take in terms of how you define competing. Because here's one for you. Do you view, I know you're not a student and you haven't necessarily been a formal student for a while, but do you view like me as a college student taking a test as a competition or do you view that as something else? I would say taking a test is an it's an evaluation it's a mm -hmm. if there's a result associated with it i would say that you like you could no doubt define it as a form of competition mm -hmm. but is it is it really you competing so the reason I mean, yeah I, time, so in, time in i would i would say it's not a competition I would say if like we were going to discuss something, you know, that would be a competition. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Brian, if you and I discussed math right now, yeah, you would probably beat me. <laughs> like, you know, I'd be <laughs> okay, the underdog enough, right now. Enough. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But if we talked about marketing, you know, it might be the other way around. Mm -hmm. I don't think tests are really competition. I don't look yeah. at it as a competition. I just look at it as like, did I look at the material enough? You know, do I know? Do I know it? So it's, yeah. it's almost less of like my skill and more of just like, did I remember it? <laughs> so yeah, I guess oh, for me that I want to dive into this, Brian. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> dive in, dive in. Dive in. <laughs> now the question is, is is a a game? You know, uh, in in soccer, in basketball, in in whatever it might be, is that a test? Mm -hmm. Right and. And you literally call it a competition, right? I mean, it's the, the game is the competition, right? But is that us competing or is that just us evaluating where our level is? And is the competition actually what takes place behind the scenes of you really mm -hmm. trying to maximize your own ability? I would say you're 100% on. You know, like when everyone, like it's a hard game, everyone says it's going to be a hard test. It's a good test that everyone says that like the majority of a soccer team, when you talk to them about a game, it's like, Oh, it'll be a good test. Like, it's never like, Oh, it'll be a good game. It's, it'll be a good test. Like, and I think you're right. Like the competition is like in practice, you know, with yourself, like being ready to go, all that is the competition. And then you're just getting prepared for the test. You know, whether that test is every Friday night, every Wednesday, every Saturday, it's, I would say that the games are more of tests rather than competitions. So it's it's defining competition, the noun, mm -hmm. as different than competing, the verb. Yep. Right? Yeah. <laughs> this went so uh, differently than I, than I <laughs> thought. <laughs> this is great. Um, awesome. So guys, this has been a great recap of, I think, one of the best conversations that we've had uh, with John Schuster. And uh, so thank you guys for, for, you know, dialing in and, and uh, thanks to everybody that's listening in. 
Next week, we're excited to announce that we've got Vid Milenkovic, a standout player who's just ended his eligibility with UW Superior, a standout basketball player here for the last few years. Um, he's actually back home in Switzerland right now uh, due to the outbreak here, but we're going to uh, dial him up uh, remotely and uh, he'll be on next Wednesday. So with that, we'll let uh, Brian give you a, a few quick plugs here. And uh, thanks again to everyone for listening in. Yeah, uh, so you can, I mentioned before at the start of the podcast where you can find our podcast stream and we're on YouTube. It, we're getting some social media and we're getting our website up and running. So on social media, you can find us at NXTLVLPOD. So Next Level Pod. We took all the vowels out except for the O in pod. And our website is NXTLVLPODCAST. So Next Level Podcast, again, all of the vowels taken out of Next Level. We'd also love if you guys would reach out to us and let us know what you think. I love getting texts or messages on my social media from people saying, hey, this is what I thought about your podcast. It means a lot, one, when people tell us how into the podcast they got, but it also is a really great opportunity for us to hear what you guys think about specific points we talked about. So if you guys have things that you loved that you didn't like or just stories that you, you think we can share, like we we use that to go into our next episodes. We're learning from what we're talking about just as much as you're learning from listening to us. And so it, it's great to hear from you. So if you reach out to us on social media, leave comments on YouTube. I don't know if you can leave comments on a podcast. Um but maybe you can um, just just give us some feedback. Otherwise, if you want to come back week after week, hit subscribe. And thank you so much for listening.